Um, I think we can get started. Uh, thanks, everyone. So it's great to see a lot more people every, lot more people every time. So it's really cool. So today, very excited to have uh, Petran uh, Asanseli coming from Rice University. He's been doing a lot of very interesting with this group, a lot of very interesting work on separate scale modeling, also very much on, on, on dynamics of the atmosphere as well. Um, so looking at a wide range of, and wide spectrum of problems, really very innovative every time. So that's really great. Uh, he got his PhD uh, back at UC Berkeley in 2013, then moved on to uh, Harvard for some time, you know, <laughs> the UC Berkeley oh, right here. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and then uh, got uh, an assistant professor position at Rice. Uh, he's been receiving uh, several awards, including the Career Award. He's involved in many of the big projects, including some of the best free projects on gravity waves, using machine learning for gravity waves. So those are exciting developments. Uh, yeah, so very much looking forward to your talk. I'm sure you will get a lot of very interesting questions at the end. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Looking forward to them. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and for the kind introduction. It's, uh, it's great to be here. And I very much enjoyed my visit and learning about all the exciting work uh, that's uh, happening at uh, LEAP. So today I'm going to tell you about some work we have been doing the past few years on using machine learning and particularly deep neural networks to improve, improve weather and climate prediction. In this talk, I will specifically uh, focus on three aspects of this work, and those are about stability, extrapolation, and interpretation. And in a few minutes, I'll tell you exactly what these terms mean in this context. Okay, so in most of the talk, um, I'll be discussing subfield scale modeling, but I'll also mention some work with spatial temporal forecasting, like weather and extreme weather forecasting. I'll mention a number of canonical uh, turbulence flows. Mainly I'll be talking about two-dimensional turbulence. Uh, but I should add that while my focus is on turbulence in this talk, uh, I think most of the work that I'll be discussing is relevant to or broadly to any type of you know, linear dynamical system. And in parts of the talk, I'll be discussing uh, concepts from turbulence physics like backscattering. And in some other parts, I will be discussing concepts from machine learning like transfer learning. And toward the end, I'll tell you about what I'm most excited about, and that's this work about uh, doing spectral analysis, like Fourier analysis of neural networks, uh, spectral analysis of the nonlinear physics, and combining them to, to start developing rigorous methods to address these questions about the stability, extrapolation, interpretation of neural networks. Now, there's a lot of stuff here. Some of these, I only have one slide about them, but I realize it's a broad audience uh, in person and online. So I wanted to pick some keyboards. So hopefully, everybody would see something here that uh, would, they would find it interesting and it would excite them for the next uh, 45 minutes. So I don't think I need to spend too much time motivating this audience that we need better extreme weather forecasts and climate change projections. Extreme weather events can be very devastating. These are examples of three extreme events I've worked on. Harvey, actually, I had to live through it myself. It was my first hurricane. And I actually ended up writing a paper about it with one of the, your colleagues here at Columbia, Chang Lee and Susanna Camargo. So with extreme weather events, we like to uh, forecast them earlier and with a smaller uncertainties. And also with climate change, we like to better estimate how the likelihood of these kind of extreme events might change in the future at the regional scale, like future hurricanes of Houston, future hurricanes of New York City. So when we talk about such details, like such regional scales, basically, the only tools that uh, we can really rely on are weather and climate models. So what we really need are better and faster models so that we can do higher quality simulations, more simulations and longer simulations so that we can address these three major sources of uncertainty that we have to deal with for climate change projections. The first two are also relevant to weather forecasting. Now, why is it difficult to have better and faster models? Well, you know, simulating the climate system is challenging. And a major source of this challenge is that we are dealing with the multi scale multi physics system. So, this cartoon here is just a reminder of the broad range of lens scales and time scales that we are dealing with in the atmosphere alone. And you can make similar cartoons for the ocean and for, for the other components of the air system. And even though in most applications we are interested in what's going on here, basically at the large and slow scales that collectively I'm going to call them X. These are like days and longer, hundreds of kilometers and longer. We can't ignore what's going on at the smaller and faster scales that I'm going to call Y because everything is nonlinearly interacting here. Now, for most processes, we actually have a good idea of the governing equations of the PDEs that we need to solve. But the problem is that we simply don't have the computing power to do that. For example, in a typical climate model with a resolution of 100 kilometers, 
everything on this side has to be somehow accounted for. Now, the typical approach to this is to use a low resolution solver to only solve for the larger scale processes. But to do that, we need to be able to write our equations just in terms of x. And we can do that by introducing this uh, like a function that I'm going to call p. And this is basically a parameterization or a closure model. It's a function that tells us something about the smaller scales as a function of the large result scales. And there have been decades of work developing physics based and semi empirical parameterization for various processes in the climate system. And there has been a lot of progress, but we know that to have better climate models and weather models, we need much better parameterization for many processes in the atmosphere, in the oceans, and land, for cryosphere, and at their interfaces. So in the past few years, there's been a lot of interest in whether machine learning can help us here. And there are various ways that machine learning can be used to potentially improve weather and climate prediction. Uh, one way is to just follow that traditional approach, except that now, instead of a physics-based parameterization, we can use some sort of data-driven parameterization. And even if we choose this approach, there are various ways to do this. At one end, we might use machine learning to better estimate some of the parameters in an existing parameterization. And at the other end, we might leave it to a machine learning technique like a neural network to learn the relationship between X and Y. And even though this kind of work just started a few years ago, there has been a lot of progress. I should say some of the best and first papers uh, doing this for the atmosphere, for, for most processes, and in the ocean, for the, uh, for the turbulence uh, in the ocean has been written by papers in this room by Pierre Gentin and Laura Zana for atmosphere and ocean. And since then, there has been a lot of great work by their groups and by other groups in this area. To give you an example of a problem that my group is interested in, another process you might not care about it a lot, but it's extremely important, and that's the gravity wave in the atmosphere. So my group is involved in two large international projects focused on improving the representation of gravity waves in the next generation of climate models. So these waves, they are generated when convection happens, when runs pass by, or when the flow interacts with the topography. And they're generated in the troposphere, and then they propagate to a stratosphere and higher altitudes, and they break and they drive the circulation variability. For example, these waves, they generate this important phenomenon in the tropical stratosphere called QBO. These waves also affect the variability of the polar vortex and a lot of other phenomena in the stratosphere and mesosphere. The problem with these waves is that they can be small. The wavelengths must be just a few kilometers. So here I'm showing you uh, basically these uh, very high resolution one kilometer simulations that we have done over this marine continent region, what I'm showing you is vertical wind at 50 kilometer altitude. And you see these beautiful gravity waves that are generated by convection in the lower troposphere. But then on this side, you see how a typical climate model would basically see these waves. It just can't capture these small waves. So as a result of that, these waves, they have to be parameterized in a state-of-the-art climate model. And currently, this is done in a rather crude fashion. So as a result of that, many state-of-the-art PCM, CMS5, even CMS6, they can't generate their own QBO. And also the response of QBO, the polar vortex and the resulting extreme events, they're all over the place in terms of the response to climate change. It's all over the place uh, in these uh, models. So there's a lot going on in this uh, project with ACI, but one of the things that my group is doing, uh, we are building a library of these high resolution simulations. We have colleagues in Germany, doing three kilometer global simulations. These are gravity wave resolving simulations, it's still their model, so to validate them, you have data from the loon balloons. These are balloons that Google used to provide internet. By looking at their trajectories, you can actually estimate gravity wave fluxes. So one of the ideas in this project is to put these data sets together, train neural networks, and develop parameterization. And in our group, we have a new postdoc who has started putting some of this parameterization into one of the NCARS model vacuum to start looking at how QBO, polar vortex, and extreme events would change with climate change. Now, everything I talked about so far was about subgrid scale modeling, pretty much following the traditional climate weather modeling approach, but by using machine learning for the subgrid scale processes. Now, in the past few years, there also has been a lot of interest in doing fully data-driven modeling, for example, fully data-driven forecasting. So here the idea is to forget all the equations that we have, forget F equals MA. Let's just train, let's say, a neural network to take the state of the atmosphere, for example, mostly for the largest scale, and predict the state 
in a few hours ahead. And then you put this back and you also aggressively march in time. Now, the appeal of this kind of approach is that this is one train, this is cheap, you can do forecasting in real time, you can generate large ensembles for probability forecasting, and you can even, for example, improve data assimilation, which is an important part of weather and extreme weather forecasting. There has been a lot of progress in this area as well. Currently, the state of the art of data driven weather forecasting is this model called ForecastNet that uses a Fourier neural operator. It's developed by NVIDIA, and my group and a number of other groups have contributed to this. It actually has remarkable performance. So, here, what I'm showing you. This is basically water vapor in reanalysis. So we consider this the truth, pretty close to observation. And ForecastNet has been trained on 40 years of these kind of data for variables. This is out of sample forecast by ForecastNet over four days. Now, for some details, especially over the tropics, you see some of the small scales are not captured. But for example, if you are interested in atmospheric rivers over the West Coast, you see that even four days out, you can do a pretty good job. The key here is that forecast net is 100,000 times faster than the best numerical weather model from the European Center. But if you look at the results in the paper, for many variables, the accuracy is actually comparable, and in a few cases, it's even better. So there has been a lot of progress already. But really, to make more progress and to make these kind of approaches operational and really practical, there are a number of major questions and challenges that our community needs to address. As you know, there has been a lot of progress in the machine learning community for commercial applications, for medical applications, but to really to effectively and reliably use these advances for, for our kind of problems in climate science, there are these questions and challenges that we need to address because in many cases, there are fundamental differences between the kind of data and applications that we have and the data and applications that machine learning has been usually used for in many other disciplines. Just to give you some examples, once we figure out the specific application, we have to teach the method, the, the, the machine learning method we want to use. And currently, there's really no theory to guide us for a specific type of data and application to tell us what method would be the best to use. Uh, even if you want to use neural networks or many architectures, there's no theory to guide us to which one to pick. So this remains perhaps one of the most at heart steps in this process. Once we pick the method, we have to figure out how to do the training in the small data regime because for many of our applications, we actually do not have a large number of high quality training samples, for example, from observations or very high resolution simulations. Fortunately, we know a lot about the physics and the governing equations of our system. So we might want to incorporate some of that into the learning process to, for example, better deal with the small data regime. Interpretability is a major issue. We like to basically have some understanding of what these methods have learned and why and how. Generalization is a major problem. This is really generalization out of distribution or extrapolation. For example, it's already been shown. And in fact, Pierre wrote one of the first papers showing this, that you take a neural network, you train it for uh, subgeneral scale modeling, you can climate, current climate data, you put it into a climate model, it works great for the current climate, you increase the sea surface temperature to mimic climate change, and then the whole model blows up. Uh, this is an example of something similar that we have been trying to do with Rayleigh Bernard convection. We expect the CNN that was used here to extrapolate over a factor of 40 in the control parameter. And you will see, this will come back, uh, that very quickly the simulation goes unstable. And so this is a major problem when we are dealing with non stationary systems like a changing climate. And aside from this extrapolation issue, instabilities are very common in applications of machine learning to climate modeling and more generally to like dealing with turbulence and multi scale dynamic systems. So in the past few years, my group has been doing some work in, uh, in these areas. And as you can imagine, it's difficult to address many of these by going to the most complicated climate model or reanalysis data. So what we have been done in the past few years, we have basically built a hierarchy of test cases, starting from the Lorentz system, uh, Berger's turbulence, 2D turbulence, PUG turbulence, all the way up to climate model data and data and reanalysis data. And so what we have been trying to do is to basically identify problems here, go to simple systems, try to understand what's going on, develop some rigorous methods when possible, and then go back and make sure that these are scalable approaches. And so we have been doing a lot of back and forth in the past few years across these systems, looking at things about subject scale modeling, forecasting, data assimilation, stability, interpretation, discovering a structural model errors and uh, things like that. So in today's talk, I will be mainly discussing results from a, from a model in the middle, two-dimensional turbulence. And I'll 
talk a little bit about issues related to stability. I'll very briefly discuss learning in the small data regime by incorporating physics. And then I'll discuss transfer learning, which is the technique that can enable neural networks to extrapolate. And then I'll talk about that spectral analysis. Okay. So the test case that we have is two dimensional turbulence. The equations are here. Omega is vorticity. The nonlinearity is, is Jacobian here. This parameter, the Reynolds number, is basically tells us how turbulent the flow is. And this system is simple enough that at the moderate Reynolds number with high enough numerical resolution, we can solve these equations without any further approximation. And we call this direct numerical simulation or DNS. And in this work, we treat DNS as the truth. Now, DNS is not practical. In the atmosphere, for example, it means solving for everything from tens of thousands of kilometers down to centimeters and even a smaller scale. So what we really want to do is what's called LES or larger dissimulation, which as the name suggests, it means let's just only solve for the larger scale features. To derive the equations for LES, we take this original equation and we low pass filter it. That over bar means low pass filter. It. And we know that when we do this, we can almost write our equations only in terms of the result variable, psi bar and omega bar, except that at the end, we will end up with this extra term that I'm going to call it pi. And it's basically the subfield scale term, the SGS term. Sometimes you see this written in terms of those time terms and the Reynolds stress, for example, is a part of this. Now, the advantage of LES is clear because these are low pass filters. We can solve these equations on a much lower resolution. And also we can take larger time steps. So LES even here can be several thousand times cheaper than DNS. But the problem is that we need a closure model or a parameterization for pi so that we can represent it in terms of psi bar and omega bar so that we can close these equations and solve them. So in the past few decades, there's been a lot of work on developing physics-based parameterizations. One of the first ones, and it's still widely used, is like a Smogorinsky, it's called the Smogorinsky model, where the idea here is that what the smallest scales do is usually to do diffusion. So let's just represent them with some sort of viscosity. It's called eddy viscosity. And so this is basically the closure model that was developed. Now, these eddy viscosity models, they're still widely used. They're popular because they only do diffusion. So the numerics become stable. But the problem is they only do diffusion. And they do a lot of diffusion. So for example, you can't capture extreme events. Give you an example. Let's look at the PDF of vorticity in this system. You can think of vorticity as the weather uh, in this toy model. And so the black line that you will see here on the other side, that's the PDF from the DNS. That's the PDF of the truth. And this dashed red line, this is basically what the Smokronsky model would give you. Uh, this, there's another line here that this is dynamic Smokronsky. And we have looked at a lot of these kind of the viscosity model, and they're always like this. They're too diffusive. So as you see, they can't capture the tails beyond like one and a half a standard deviation, so they miss the extreme events because they're just too diffusive. So the question has been in the past few years, can machine learning do better? Can it train some sort of machine learning technique like a neural network to find this, to learn this relationship and learn diffusion correctly and other things that are important here? Now, there are various ways that machine learning can be used to do this, and there are even various ways to categorize the approaches. So here I have categorize the approaches based on how interpretable they are. So on one side, we have deep neural networks, which are very powerful in pretty much learning any functional relationship, but infamously they are hard to interpret. And then on the other side, we have these equation discovery techniques that are very powerful and becoming even more powerful. And these are techniques usually based on sparse uh, regression, and you basically show them data and they give you equations, which sound pretty magical, but of course, we know that nothing works like that. So if you go through the details, we see that there's a lot of prior knowledge built into, for example, the libraries that they have. There are a lot of tuning parameters. So at the end, I would say mostly they have been very successful in discovering equations we already knew about. Of course, there are some exceptions. For example, Laura Zana has used this approach to discover an equation you actually don't know what it should be for subfield scale modeling of uh, ocean metal scale IDs. And, they are found really interesting this stuff. So there are exceptions like that. And overall, I would say these methods are very powerful and can be very, very useful. The point I'm trying to make here is that as much as neural networks are criticized for being black boxes, these equation discovery techniques are also not crystal balls that you know, give us the secrets of the universe without doing any, any extra work. 
Now, once you pick your approach, there's also a way of doing offline learning, and then there's a way of what's called online learning. I'm not going to talk about online learning here, but basically, if you follow uh, that approach, you use things like ensemble common inversion, reinforcement learning. Our group has something based on data assimilation, and that's one reason that differentiable modeling has been uh, becoming very popular. Uh, and our group has been uh, doing some work with Petrus and Tapia's group uh, on these two, and also using this third approach that we have to do online learning. But today, I'm going to mainly focus on this branch, the branch of using deep neural networks and offline learning. Because currently, this is the most, I would say, mature approach that we have, and it's widely used. It's used at LEAP, in M2 line, in the Gravity Wave project that we have, and by many other groups around the world for, for example, subject stress models. So what we are going to do here in, in this dealing with two-dimensional prevalence is that we are going to use a convolutional neural network with 10 layers to learn a sub scale model. Basically, the inputs would be snapshots of the result flow, and the output would be those patterns that we need. Now, for the training, we can go to the DNS data, and we can filter the data and get these inputs. And also, we can do the same thing and extract that pipe Now, because of time, I'm not going to go to the details, but that is said, how you get that pipe term is extremely important and tricky. So even in this system, it depends a lot on the filter you use, on the filter lens you use, exactly what term you include in that, the results can be affected. And uh, for example, in our gravity wave project, you can imagine this becomes a very, very major step and something very difficult. And has been, have been spending a year on figuring out how to get that pi term out of those high resolution simulations I showed. And we're just writing a paper around that. So the point is that's a very important step because the best neural network is just as good as how good the data that we showed it as the tools would be. But for now, let's just assume that we have done it right and we have the right pi term. Now, I should clarify, for now, I'm going to show you results of the physics agnostic network. It's the same thing you can use to find cats and dogs. But I will mention some results of the physics informed by. It's currently deterministic, doesn't have memory, and it doesn't provide uncertainty on the output. And these three are, of course, very important, and we have done some work on them, but for now, let's just keep it simple and use the simpler versions. One thing we have done here is that instead of a local model, we are developing a non-local closure, meaning that it uses information from the whole domain or parts of the domain to predict the pi term. And that's because we think accounting for these spatial correlations can be important. The results I'm going to show you are from this paper that was published in JCP. Uh, last year, this work that was led by Yife, who's a postdoc in our group, with Ashish, who just defended his PhD last week, and also with Adam, who was an undergraduate in, in our group, and now is a PhD student with Laura at the Grant Institute. Okay, before showing you any results, let's also talk about the equations of DCNN. Many of you uh, probably already know these equations, but I will need them later, so let's just sort of go through them. So this is basically the equation that governs the CNN. So this G, this is called activation. This is the output of a channel from a layer. And here it's 128 by 128 metrics because that's the size of our LES screen. So the activation from a layer depends on the activations from the previous layer. After these matrices Ws, they do convolution on them. So Ws, these are small five by five matrices here that do convolution. Uh, and these are the main thing you learn when you train a CNN. So there are five by five, we have four thousands of them in each layer, 10 layers, so we have a million learnable parameters. We also have these biases we have to learn, but there's a small number of them. So everything so far is linear, except that at the end, we apply a nonlinear activation function. To find W and B, we minimize the loss function here and MSD loss with N training samples. So as much as neural networks are called, uh, or the scene is called black boxes, the math is actually pretty simple. The issue is that it's hard to know what they have learned and why. So here I'm showing you one of the kernels that we have, and it basically looks like this. It's hard to look at it and get anything meaningful out of it. But uh, towards the end of the talk, I'll come back to this and I'll tell you exactly what this, is, what this kernel is. I'll tell you what basically all of these 40,000 kernels that we have learned are. But for now, let's say we train the CNN and now we're unseen side bar and omega bar, we can predict the pi term. And we can go and couple it to the LES solver. So now the LES solver would provide the CNN with the results below. This would predict pi. We put it back and march in time. So it's basically supervised learning. In the climate community, it's called offline learning because we learn the CNN offline and then we put it back. 
Now, as you can imagine, the online learning means you learn W and B as you run the LES solver. And that approach has advantages, but also a number of challenges. Okay, so let's see what we get. So we did a number of experiments. For example, we used 5,000 or 10,000 training samples. And first we did what's called offline tests, which is basically you look at pattern correlation between the pi terms you have learned, so of course all out of sample, and the pi terms from the DNS. And we found that the accuracy is pretty good. You double the data, go up by like 0.01, but then we put this back into the LES solver, what's called online learning, uh, online tests, it shouldn't be confused with online learning, but I think as a community, we're also trying to find better names for this. The simulations go unstable. And many other people had already reported these for this system, other turbulence flows, and different climate models. And they stopped here because people started thinking that, well, you double the data, the accuracy barely goes up, and you still get an unstable flow. So probably there is something fundamentally wrong with this approach. Maybe the way that the pi term was extracted, or, or there's something else in numerical errors and things like that. What we did here, we kept increasing n, and then at some point we saw that well, you get to fifty thousand samples, and these pattern correlations will barely improve, but then you get a stable simulations. And so we started thinking about the physics of our system. Of course, we know that in reality, the pi term is not just about diffusion. The subcritical scale terms are not just doing diffusion; they're also doing something that is like anti-diffusion, called backward scattering. This is when the smallest scales are forcing the larger scales. And it's a real phenomenon, and it has been a lot of effort to account for them in physics-based models. We like to include them in the atmosphere models, in the ocean, in a lot of engineering flows. People have worked on including these backward scattering into physics-based models, but every time they found it to be unstable. So we thought, okay, let's just look at a slightly different metric. So we, we calculated the correlations, except that we only looked at part of the pi term that was doing backward scattering. And then we found that, well, with a small training set, even though the polar correlation was 0.9, the backward scattering was poorly less, it was at 0.5. And then we increased the number of training samples, even though the total correlation barely improved, it was really this correlation that it was improving. So with more data, what we did better was to learn this backward scattering, and then that led to stability. And in the paper, we have a lot of more analysis and discussions about connections to the physics-based modeling and things like that, and why it makes a lot of sense for backward scattering to be the cause of uh, instability. Now, when the CNN is stable, you can see its advantages. So back to this PDF, there's a blue line here, and that's the CN, that's the LES that with the CNN. And if you look at it, it actually captures all the, the tails on both sides, captures the extreme events up to like five feet per standard deviation, because it has learned to do the right amount of diffusion and the right amount of backward scan. Now, the results aside, Something that's important here is that really the choice of the metrics that you use to evaluate these models. And usually the metrics are chosen based on the loss function that was used. So you say really a problem of the metrics and the loss functions that you use, and that's the cause of getting these kind of results. Very high accuracy when you look at things offline and then instability. So that's one of the points that I'll come back to it again and again I emphasize it. Many of you might say, well, of course, this is like a trivial point. But keep in mind, a lot of that has been done in the past, including by us, and a lot of ongoing work, which is still all about physics, uh, unaware choices of metrics and loss functions. And I think that's a major part of this problem. Okay, so we can get a stable model, but an accurate model. The issue is that we need a lot of data. So the next question is, can we include some physics? And there are different pieces of physics that can be included. For example, there are symmetries or information about some conserved quantities that we can include. So in this work, uh, we try to include two things. One is basically some sort of symmetry, really the equivariance that if you rotate your input, your output should also rotate. And you can include that by doing data augmentation or by using like equivariant CNN that this can be baked into the architecture. Another thing we did in the loss function, we added a second term, basically a regularization term that, uh, that basically that term know something about the, the interscale energy and entropy transfer. So some information about backward scattering in that second term. Because of time, I'm not going to go to the details, but basically we have a paper that uh, just came out in Physica D, and we show that if you include that loss function with one of these two, you can actually get the same stability and accuracy out of the CNN with 40 times fewer training samples, which again shows the 
but what you can get by start to be more physics aware, aware uh, loss functions and information in the training topics. Okay, so we can have a stable, accurate uh, closure model. We can do this in the small data regime. Can this extrapolate? Can we, for example, work across the range of real sums? And the answer is no. So here I'm showing you the energy spectrum. The black line is the truth is from the DNA. The blue line is if the CNA is trained on a real number of 8,000, tested on the real number of 8,000, and you see that it works well. If I take this and use it as a flow with the real number of 64,000, then we will get this red line. So you see that it's not working. It's a simulation that if I continue it, at some point it will blow up. So the CNA is not extrapolating, and this shouldn't be surprising. These methods are not expected to work out of distribution. And of course, this is known in the well known in the machine learning community, and there is a solution for it, and that's called transfer learning. So the idea of transfer learning is that so far what we did, we had a base system, we took n samples from it, we randomly initialized 10 layers of the CNA, we trained it, we find W and D, and that CNN worked for that system. Now let's say we have a new system, that red one, the target system, and it's different, its PDF is different from the base system because let's say the radiative forcing had changed, uh, the boundary condition might have changed, uh, the Reynolds number might have changed, and we don't have another n samples from this new system, but we have a small number, like we have a, like a percent system. And it's not enough to train 10 layers again. So what we are going to do is that we are going to freeze most of the layers based on what we had before, and we are going to use this as a small amount of data to retrain some of the layers, and this is called transfer learning. And the literature, machine learning literature, basically tells us that to retrain the deepest layers. So the idea is that the shallow layers, they learn the general features, and it's the deepest layers that learn the difference between the red and the blue PDF, the data that comes from. So we did that uh, first for the Lorentz system, and we found that it actually works pretty well. And then we used it on this 2D turbulence problem. So we took this CNN, we retrained it with 1% of data from this higher Reynolds number, and then we got this dashed red line. So we said it works pretty well now. It actually worked as well as if we had 100 times more data from this higher Reynolds number. So transfer learning works pretty well. And in the last year or so, we have been thinking about, well, how far can we push this transfer learning? And also can we start understanding what is learned during transfer learning? So to do that, we changed our system a little bit. We added a forcing term, a damping term, and we created three cases. And each case has a base system here and a target system. For example, here, the base system has a round number of 1,000, and the target system has a round number of 100,000. So we are expecting like a two order of magnitude extrapolation in the Reynolds number. Now, if you look at these cases, you see that if you look at the flow or the pi terms or the spectra, you see that these are actually pretty different flows. And in some cases, even the dynamics in terms of the cascade and things like that are different. One thing to remember is that when we look at the spectra of the pi term, the term we are trying to predict, they are always different, mainly in the larger scale. Here, here. So long as they're short, we found that if we don't do transfer learning, we can't go from any of the base systems to target systems. If we do transfer learning, it works. But also we did something else. We tried all combinations of one, two, three, four layers that we can retrain. And then we found something interesting. For cases two and three, layer two, the shallowest layer on its own was the best layer to retrain. And in case one, layer two was doing most of the work, but adding layer five made that pair the best. And this is opposite of what the literature suggests, which is to retrain the deepest layers, like layer 9, 10. Here, what we found is that the shallowest layer, layer 2, is actually the best layer to retrain. So we start asking these questions that, well, what is the physics that's learned during transfer learning? Can we actually predict what would be the optimal layer before doing all of these trial and errors that can become very expensive? And can we use this knowledge to actually reduce the amount of data that is needed to do the training? Now, when you study turbulence and you analyze turbulence flows or climate data, usually we like to look at things in the spectral space, in the Fourier space, for example. So we started asking, well, can we do the same thing for our neural network? Can we understand what controls the change in the spectrum of, the, of these activations and at the end from the input to the output? So to remind you, this is the equation for the CNN. 
And it turns out you can write the Fourier transform of the activation. So to do that, first, you take that blue part and call that H. It's all linear operations. And there's a convolution operator here. So if you use the convolution theorem, you can actually write this, that the Fourier transform of this H hat is element-wise multiplication of the Fourier transform of the kernel and the Fourier transform of the activation from the previous layer. Now, even though there is a linear function here, and that's real u here, you can still write down analytically the Fourier transform. And this is what you get. So there is a sum here that's over the grid points where h is positive that comes from the real u. What's here is basically the Fourier transform of the heavy type function. So what this tells us is that the Fourier transform, the spectrum of the activation, depends on this term, but also mainly depends on the Fourier spectrum of the kernel. It suggests that instead of looking at our kernels in this physical space of looking at them at five by five matrices, we should look at their Fourier transform. So to do that, we just had this with zero to 128 by 128, and then you do two D SFT. And so this is what we got. So here, this is wave number in the X direction, wave number in the Y direction. So we see that this kernel was just some sort of filter which was zero everywhere except for this block at the center. So this was just a low pass filter. And we realized that, okay, but forget transfer learning for a moment. We can use this to actually understand everything about that CNN that we have trained, even for the base system. And this is work that was led by Adam when he was the undergraduate student in our group. So Adam looked at the Fourier transform of all those 40,000 kernels, or well, some of them. And then he realized that, well, there's lots of similarities. And so he said, okay, let's just came in cluster them. So here what I'm showing you for three of those CNNs that we had, these are the cluster centers for 4,000 kernels in layer two. This is for layer 10. The other layers look similar. And you see that generally there is a lot of similarity. So for example, there are lots of low pass filters like this. There are high pass filters. And then there are some filters that are band pass filters and they look like this. Now you might recognize what these are. These are basically Gabor filters. So if you take a, like a sine function, multiply with the Gaussian, you get these filters, and this is the spectra. It has been known that Gabor filters, known for decades, that these are filters that are very good to find textures. So basically, I can tell you everything that this CNN has learned. It's a combination of low pass, high pass, and Gabor filters. Of course, we are doing clustering, so things about frequency and lots of details are lost. But if you look at them individually, basically, they fall in one of these categories. Now, I should say that it has been known in the machine learning literature for a long time that CNNs can learn Gabor filter. But as far as I know, it's the first time this kind of analysis has been done for dynamical systems or of any kind. And in fact, analysis can be done this way. Now, even beyond the literature about CNNs, there's a lot of in the neuroscience literature about the Gabor filters that there's evidence that in our visual cortex we have Gabor filters. But also there are papers, for example, like this, that they argue that if you're trying to learn data with these properties, which are basically the properties of the data that we have, then these are the optimal set of basis functions for the learning. And the key to learn these kind of basis functions is to have a start learning, which our CNNs have through over parameterization. My point is that there's a lot of interesting ideas and a lot of things in other disciplines out there that we can leverage and start understanding what's going on. For example, in a problem like subgrid scale modeling, uh, and make more progress and understand uh, what our CNNs are doing. Now, even though I can't tell you everything that the CNN has learned, so all those 1 million parameters basically about this, I still can't tell you what happens from the input to the output because there are 10 layers, there are nonlinear functions. But I think there's an opportunity here to probably make more progress. For example, you can realize that this is basically a delta function. Also, there might be a lot of redundancy that we can build a skeleton model based on these. So this is something we are very excited about in our group and we're doing more work along these directions so that we can maybe start making more sense of the whole CNN. But for the transfer learning, fortunately, we can already make more progress because remember in transfer learning, we only needed to retrain just one layer. Still, each layer has 4,000 kernels. But when we look at the changes in those kernels, we see that when we do transfer learning, only a few of them change because we are in the lazy training regime. So here, I'm showing you the four kernels that have changed the most when we retrain layer two in case two. 
And this is what happened during transfer learning. So transfer learning took kernels that were not doing much and turned them into low pass systems. And this makes a lot of sense here because remember that our pi terms were different in the large steps. So the CNA, the transfer learning basically said, okay, I've been shown new data, it's different from my old data in large scales. So I'm going to learn a bunch of low pass filters to capture the difference. And it seems that layer two can do this pretty well. On the other hand, layer 10 just can't do that. So these are the four kernels that have changed the most. Then we retrain layer 10. It basically took some kernels that were doing some stuff or nothing and turned them into some other kernel. And those are clearly not low pass filters. But if you add layer 10 right before a linear layer, you really need low pass filters if you want to learn changes in the large scale. Now, I can tell you why layer two can do this and layer three can. And I don't think anybody out there can. But fortunately, there are some ideas in the machine learning literature based on looking at the convexity of the lost landscape. They can give us some idea about what are the best layers to start with for retraining. I'm not going to go through the details. Basically, this is an idea based on taking your weights and perturbing them in the ran random directions and reevaluating your loss and then plotting things like this. We perturb things in two directions, the delta one, delta two are the amplitude of the perturbation because two directions are easy to visualize. And basically this idea says, if you look at your landscape and if it's smooth and convex, this is a good layer to retain. If it's not convex, then this is not a good layer. So you can get some idea about where to start. Okay, so more recently, we have been using these ideas, this basically type of analysis for systems that are not, not isotropic or uh, homogeneous, like really Bernard convection and two layer QG uh, turbulence uh, collaboration with LoRa, and we find the same thing. You get a stable accurate result if you have large enough data sets, uh, or if you, add, if you add physics, if you don't do transfer learning, you can't extrapolate. If you do, you can. For example, the results I showed you before, this is really Bernard at the Rayleigh number of a million, this at the Rayleigh of 40 million, this is what you get if you don't do transfer learning. This is what you get if you do transfer learning. And you see that without transfer learning, the subgrade scale model very quickly blows up. If you do transfer learning, even though this simulation has much lower resolutions than this, the heat transfer in neutral number is pretty good. So in this work, we also have been, again, doing the same thing in terms of explainability. And also we are following some ideas like that. If we know how our neural net in doing transfer learning, how the kernels should change, can we better initialize our kernels so that uh, we can actually do the transfer learning to the smaller amount of data? So we have put these ideas together uh, into a framework that basically is about start with your data, do a spectral analysis of your data, look at these lost landscapes, it would guide you to which layers would be the best to start retraining with. Then once you do the transfer learning, look at the spectra of the activations of the weights, and then try to connect that the physics. And for the 2D results, we actually have a paper that's in revision and you can check it out. And I should say that transfer learning is not just, of course, for subgrade scale modeling. It's also not just for extrapolation in a parameter, even if you want to effectively combine different data sets for training. For example, the small amount of balloon data we have, the very large amount of model data that we have, transfer learning is the way to combine these data sets. So we are going to use these ideas in our grad debate project both for climate change applications and for these kind of combined data sets. So I told you about this spectral analysis, which is I'm very excited about, but in the next few minutes that I have, I want to tell you about another place where we found this spectral analysis to be useful. So I mentioned ForecastNet and ForecastNet, and there are now a number of other data-driven weather models that actually show remarkable accuracy for short term. term. Uh, I like it in like seven days they can do a pretty good job. But the question is, what happens if you keep running these models? Are they long-term stable or not? Of course, it's a chaotic system. So at some point you will lose the trajectory. But if you can keep running and produce data that is physically consistent, these data sets can be very useful to look at rare events and things like that. And notice that here, I'm defining long-term stable, not to just be a simulation that gives you numbers rather than a NAND, but also something that gives you the right mean and variability so that you can use that data. Now, this is what happens, for example, with ForecastNet, if you just keep running it. This is, again, the true data from era five. Day seven of ForecastNet looks good. Day 14 looks okay. 
This is what happens at day 22. The model is basically unstable. And this is not just a problem of forecasting. As far as I know, every data-driven model that's out there goes unstable. And in fact, anybody who has tried on any kind of turbulence flow, they go unstable eventually. Again, they might not give you NAN, but they will give you something that is completely unpredictable. So in work that uh, my student Ashish has been doing, they've been trying to understand, well, what is the cause of this instability if there is just one cause? Because different papers are discussing different reasons, and also they have been using different ad hoc solutions for this. And if you understand the cause can be mitigated. So what they did, we again did the same kind of spatial analysis of the weights and kernels and things like that. But where we found that, uh, and also be most useful, is just look at the spectrum, the free spectrum of the output. So this is for the forecast net data. The red line, that's the spectrum from error five. And what's shown here, these are from day one, two, and three of forecast net. You see that the pattern correlation, the common metrics that is used is up very high. But from the very beginning, the, the, large, the large wave numbers are missed. But don't worry about these spikes, that's have a different reason, but that's not the cause of instability. We went to a different architecture. We used a unit and the same data, and we saw the same thing. We even went to a simpler system, a two-layer QG model. And again, we see that even from the first time step, that's this line, you lose the high wave numbers, even though something like pattern correlation is pretty high. So you, first of all, this is another example of when the common metrics are bad, because you look at these and you say, well, this is a pretty good model, even though there are problems at the small scales that could come back and basically cause troubles later. Now, some of you might realize what this issue is. This is basically a spectral bias, which is this problem of fundamental challenge that neural networks have in learning high wave number, high frequencies. And there's been a lot of very nice theoretical work in the machine learning community on this. But this is not a problem if you are trying to look at cats and dogs and things like that. But when you are looking at turbulence flows, especially when you are doing this kind of autoregressive uh, predictions, these errors would grow and come back and affect the whole simulation. So basically, the problem has two parts. Losing accuracy at the small scales due to spatial bias, and then this error growth that's because of the nonlinear physics and the inverse cascade. So to solve this, we have been doing a few things. One is, of course, the obvious one, which is let's lose a, a loss function that knows something about high wave numbers. So we have added basically high wave numbers as a regularization term so that we can emphasize learning them. But this is not going to solve the problem on its own because it's a continuous system. There's no scale separation. Every scale you choose, again, there would be a setup of small and large. No matter any wave number you miss, it seems that it would come back eventually and affect your simulation. The other thing we have been using is we have changed the way we do time integration because we figured out the way that the time integration has been done for any of these models is that they were based on non-convergent integration. So basically in like numeric analysis 101, time and step size decreases, the error should go down. And for neural networks, it's not just if you use the Euler method that happens. It seems that at least here, with longer cut of force order, you get that. But again, this is pretty empirical. I think there's a lot of opportunities to develop rigorous methods so that we can do this kind of convergence and accuracy analysis of neural networks. But anyway, we, did, we put this together plus another thing that I'm not going to talk about because of time. But now we have this framework called FORC with Fourier loss, with Ranga Kuta, and the self supervising layer. And now we have a stable model. This is 100,000 year days. On QG, you see the mean is captured and the EOFs, the modes of variability are captured. The other side doing this for reanalysis is a thousand day stable uh, run. This is the mean of Z500 in both hemispheres, and that's the PDF. The unit, after just a, a tens of days, it just completely goes on a stable. So with that, uh, this is the last slide. Again, just a summary of a few of those points. This whole issue about the physics of air metrics and loss functions that I think is extremely important. And I know that many other people are thinking about this. Laura has a nice paper about benchmarking and metrics that uh, was recently published. Uh, Pierre, we were talking today. Again, pretty much the same stuff. So of course, this is something that the community is thinking about. And finally, there's this uh, whole idea of the spatial analysis that I'm very excited about. And I think uh, it can help us start developing more rigorous methods to address those problems about interpretability, stability, and extrapolation, especially once we combine with some other ideas that are out there, the machine learning community. So with that, I stop here and I look forward to your questions.
I'm sort of interested in that thing that you mentioned again on the conclusion slide that was like the physics aware loss functions. And um, when you added that um, that term that was basically the the, the extra loss to, for the grid scale, the sub grid scale um, energy transfer, um, I wonder how like you, you can tune that with just offline learning because it, it seems like it's added mostly for stability, but it's really hard to measure stability, or it's possible to measure stability offline. So. And, and, and it, it must have some sort of loss, like regularization, because uh, I mean, it, even, it even has different units than like the, the closure terms themselves. So uh, I'm just curious how, how you how you determine how much to weight that. Yeah, so there is a hyperparameter there, of course, that you have to tune between the MSC part and that other part, right? But but the point I'm trying to make is that so the, in, in, the, in the world of turbulence modeling, there's this whole idea of structural modeling versus functional modeling. The structural modeling is when you match the stresses, which is exactly what the MSC loss does. And then there is a functional modeling, which to account for what is the effect of the SGS term in terms of energy and entropy transfer. And when you do physics-based modeling, you follow one, and there has been effort in combining them. So basically that loss combines the idea of functional modeling and structural modeling. And that's why it works better. Which again, uh, in the turbulence in the LES community, there have been many papers that just by matching tau, you are not going to get good online performance. And so there are more information, and this is one of them. There are other things that we can include. My point is, even in the offline training, there, there is information that can be included in the loss function that would improve the online performance because it would capture these interscalation. When you do online learning, you're actually not going to learn any tau that would match the tau from the truth, but you are going to get that interscale energy transfer value. Uh, so that's a long answer to uh, very helpful. <laughs> Any other questions? Anything else? Yeah, I'm interested in the choice of like the, the non local. Um, effects for the CNN for the large eddy simulation because I, I, I would imagine that there are some very important non local effects, but in my mind, they would mostly affect the resolved scales of turbulence. And since you're doing like an un, you know, you're trying to parameterize the un, uh, uh, why exactly do you think that non locality is so important? So, I should first of all. So there is a paper that was published for us that they just used the local model with a little non-locality, and they also had very good offline performance. So I'm not saying necessarily to get things right, you need to have non-locality, but I think it's reasonable to think that for non-locality accounting for spatial correlations can help. There is one thing that I should say here is that when you do this kind of coarse graining, you are going to introduce memory. So there's like the Maurice Lanzig formalism that tells you when you do coarse graining, you are going to introduce memory. And here we are, we don't have memory, right? We expect, we are, we are assuming that you can completely predict the SGS term by knowing the snapshot, right? On the other hand, there are non-Markovian effects that you, by, by, you should include. We are not doing that. And in, when we use this CNN, when we include memory, it doesn't help. But it is possible that if you're using a local, very local model, then you should really have memory. And that's why one reason that people actually have been developing a stochastic model is to account for memory. So I'm not saying that necessarily you need to have this kind of non-local model, although there's a paper from Poro Grumman and Yanni Yobel's group that they show that even for convection, including just the adjacent points helps a lot in getting better closure models. So I think this is still one of those things that it's more based on empirical results, but also based on physics, there might be some reasons they help. Okay, I think maybe I misunderstood non local. I was thinking, I was interpreting non local as global, like so something very remote, and then, which it would affect, I think, not in later layers, but maybe that's what's. Yeah, but the, yeah, here we just use the whole thing. But again, like if you are doing it for ocean, like again, Laura has a paper that they just use boxes, not the whole, you know, global ocean. So you can imagine you can calculate some sort of, you know, a spatial lens scale, right, and the correlation. And that, that is what you need to have. Right. Yeah. I think you made a, a really strong case that looking at Fourier space 
provides a lot of benefits when you're dealing with turbulence flows. And this is, I guess, if you study turbulence, maybe not surprising, but still very effective uh, technique. I feel like the, the next logical step is like you're still training these these neural networks in physical space, right? But can you, I mean, are, are you using a, a, a pseudo spectral model? And could you instead just say our primary space would be uh, Fourier space and train our neural networks in KL space? Yes. So, yeah, no, that's a great idea. And uh, um, we tried it. We didn't get any advantage out of it, but also it's one of those things that like a student has spent a day, right? And they say it didn't work, right? But uh, there could be a lot of advantage in doing such a thing. I should say that also, in, in, like in, in Keras, you can go and change the default and you can do the convolutions actually in the Fourier space, right? So that is one way to do n log n, right? Rather than n squared kind of operation. So even inside neural, even though your input is in the physical space, your output is in the physical space, it is possible that your neural network is actually doing computations in the spectral space, right? But the point is, again, just by changing the input out to a spectral space, you didn't get anything out of it. Also the loss, just by putting it into the uh, spectral space, you don't necessarily get anything out of it. But, but again, like here, the loss, when you split it into two parts, we got something. And uh, in terms of using the whole uh, flow in a spectral space, again, there might be advantages. It's just like figuring out how to do it in the best way. Anyway, it's the answer like all over the place. But yeah, this is something we have been thinking about. There could be also like just using not just Fourier transform, maybe wavelength, things like that. I mean, there could be much smarter ways. That, that's, that's the point. For loss, for, for activation functions, like if you look at the spectral bias problem, it actually depends on the Fourier transform of the activation. So how that would interact with the Fourier transform of your flow. I mean, these are things that probably we can do much smarter things. Uh, to fix this problem. Excellent, that was great. So I think on your last piece of work, right, you kind of almost came over the fact that you can emulate error five over many, many days, which is a huge achievement. Um, so I mean, when you think about it and kind of take a step back and think about the big picture, I mean, that means we can actually do many ensembles, right? If we are thinking about creating emulators of the oceans and atmosphere. I mean, I still don't want to throw away physics right away. I'm staying on the physics camps. But if we want to, you know, try to actually have some uncertainty in our projections and having some cheap emulators that we can rely on, I mean, you know, what, what do you think? No, exactly. We've been able to achieve something that many people have been trying for some time. Yeah, exactly. And I should, so, for, I mean, we can't trust physics because with these emulators, you can't study climate change, right? Which there's no now for CO2, right? But to your point, so, I mean, we did some work on the stability with Ashesh, and then we stopped working because we we're not sure how it would be useful. But if you remember in KITP, we talked to Alistair and to you, and we realized there is this opportunity for emulators, right? And so uh, then we actually started working on this again. So again, I think more work is needed to really look at these flows in a more rigorous way. I mean, I'm saying the mean is there, right? And I should say nine months ago, we had the mean, the EOFs were wrong. Then we did more work, the EOS were wrong. Who knows, a lot of other things that are important if you are building an emulator that could be wrong. So I think we need to, again, come up with better metrics, right, to really evaluate it as an emulator. But yes, I think, I think there is a lot of room there. I think there were also efforts in building ocean emulators that were also unstable, right? And this kind of approach might help us in, in getting the to be stable, and then they can be very useful. Uh, and again, there are a lot of great ideas out there with like Jonathan Beery is talking about like they have this rare event sampling method, right? That required large ensembles that can do well in short term. Well, here is a method that can do well in short term and produce huge ensembles. So I think there's a lot that can be done with these methods once they are properly validated. Any other uh, questions? Great, thank you so much. Um, so, you know, a lot of people come from like Talking about online learning, saying that's great because then you can improve stability. But you know, I mean, I think a lot of us would have the discussion that maybe if you tweak the offline metrics, you know, maybe you can do a better job. And you kind of made that point pretty clearly. You know, and one of the advantages is that then you can really work on the architecture, like a posterior, you can potentially have a much well better defined problem. So, what's your take on that? I'm just being curious, like, do you still have any, is there anything that you find useful in online learning? I, I feel like the, I think the online, offline, um, 
I think, again, this depends on the timeline people have, what they are trying to fix, right? I mean, there's the nice thing about online learning is uh, you can use observations, right? You can use sparse, noisy, as uh, some nice work that, that you guys are doing. Uh, for example, in our QBO project, of course, the whole goal is uh, the Skyway project to get the QBO right. So why not just have the QBO statistics as a measure? Uh, but anyway, so it really depends on the problem. And I think it's nice that different groups are using different approaches. But I think there's one advantage that I would say the online learning it still has over offline, and that it doesn't require you to go and extract that Pi term, the SGS term, which, like in our gravity based project, is a major source of problems. So I think it still has that advantage, but also whether you get good results just by error cancellation, right? When you're just tuning some parameters, that's another problem with online learning, right? So I think, again, you have to like as a community probably try these different ones, but as we discussed today, we really need to have better benchmarks and metrics, right? So that we're not just looking at something that is uh, dominated by the larger scale. So we think we have something accurate, even though you look at the spectrum is completely off and there are many other things that can be off, right? Uh, but also many people keep saying offline is completely hopeless and I don't think that's true. And I think just add more physics and uh, we can get to work. Yeah, there are different things, maybe a lot of potential is offline and then, and then online with correlations and then uh, as you said, like stuff competing with the model, like yeah. all of the errors that you would have in those kinds of models. And also like a lot of online approaches, they need some decent priors. Otherwise they, so the, the online methods, sure, when they work in, 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 in inference, they would be a stable, but then you have a lot of instability problems during the training, right? Which can make things very expensive. So having good priors for methods like ensemble common inversion, they can be useful. So that's another reason to also do the offline stuff. Thank you. Yeah, but uh, oh yeah, ForecastNet currently doesn't use any of that information, but because it uh, basically uses the, the information from the whole globe, it basically knows where, where the topography is and where the land ocean is. But otherwise there's no information about that in, in, the, in, the, in the forecast net. So in the case you were showing that uh, when you did transfer learning, you sometimes start to uh, retrain the shallow layers, which are like the big filters that you have. Does that suggest that if you want uh, the model set generalized, you need extremely Oh, that's a good point. You mean because we have these uh, low pass filters? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good point. I don't know. Again, I'm not saying that the non local method models wouldn't work, but of course, they are not going to get any of these, right? So, um, yeah, maybe. I think, I think we need to do more work. And uh, again, like Fourier transform is one way you can do wavelets, right? And just to see what like a more detailed analysis with wavelets tell us about uh, what kind of uh, filters you need. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm, I'm a big fan of having accounting for spatial correlations that have non-local closure, but tactically it's something actually not easy in, in, in climate modeling, not to break a polarization of the whole GCM. Actually, I don't think currently there is no parameterization that is non-local uh, as far as I know. Yeah, 